Good morning. We are so glad that you have decided to join us for the next hour in worship, and we hope you receive a blessing. Would you join me for our call to worship this morning? It's Come Thy Fount of Every Blessing. Good morning. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is great to see you today. I hope that you feel welcome because you are, uh, that, that you belong because you do, and that God has a plan and a purpose for your life because he does. God tells it in, in his word in the, in the prophet Isaiah, I know the plans I have for you. They're for good and not for evil. Uh, they're for, to, uh, to not harm you, but they're to, they're to help you. And so we praise the Lord for that. That's good news today, isn't it? I say uh, Isaiah, I think it's Jeremiah as a matter of fact. But at any rate, I want to thank you for being here today. Thank you for your presence. Uh, thank you for worshiping with us online. Let me talk to you a little bit about next week. I have an announcement about that I would like to share with you. We will begin next week at the 830 worship service to begin our gradual and systematic a phased-in approach to uh uh, going back to in-person worship here at the Upworth United Methodist Church. What we're asking is only those who typically attended the 830 worship service prior to our cancellation of in-person worship services here at Epworth because of the coronavirus epidemic. We're asking only those who attended typically the 830 worship service uh, to attend next week at the 830 worship service. We're also asking those who would who are intending who typically attend the 8:30 worship service um, to register your attendance or pre-register your attendance, I should say, with the church office. In fact, if you typically attended the 8:30 worship service before we had to start canceling in-person worship here at Epworth because of the epidemic, if you were one of those people, then you should have received a letter from me last week, as a matter of fact, and it would have given you instructions and also some guidelines and some protocol, some uh, expectations we have uh, for you as you attend. We want you to be, if you will, to be cooperative with those guidelines for safety, for the safety of your safety, and for the safety of other people. So again, we will begin that phased-in approach, but only for those who typically attended the 8.30 worship service prior to the coronavirus epidemic. Now, we will in time bring along the 945 and the 11 o'clock worship services for those who typically attended those two worship services. But right now, we're beginning to systematically. We're doing it gradually. We're trying to do it safely and, um, and follow the guidelines uh, that we, we uh, feel like would be most helpful to our church 
uh, and what God is leading us to do more importantly. So that having said all that, I look forward to spending some more time in worship with you today. And now I think we're going to uh, sing about a precious name. Would you join me in our hymn of praise, Precious Name? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and in life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to spend some time with you in prayer this morning. Uh, I know that prayer is a, the most, one of the most powerful things that anyone can do for anyone else or for the world itself. I'm, I'm, I'm told that prayer moves the hand that moves the world, and I'm convinced of that. And, I'm, and I believe that God answers prayers. In fact, I just had one of my prayers answered my just a moment ago. I've, I've always wanted to sing with a professional group, but I've never been invited to. There are a number of reasons why I've never been asked to sing with a professional group or a professional person, but um, just a moment ago, I had my desires fulfilled. Uh, I understand that my microphone was on in the first hymn, and that, uh, Kevin, you and I were doing a duet. It, it sounded marvelous, didn't it? We need to, we're going to take our, road, uh, our show on the road, aren't we? I'll tell you. No, I don't think so. I have a sense that probably the, 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 our Facebook folk were lighting our, our <laughs> page up this morning and when I started singing, but I want to tell you what, God does answer prayer in all seriousness. And he is a powerful God answering prayer. Uh, he is a uh, prayer answering God, and we praise his holy name. Today, can we just spend some time in conversation with him? Well, Father God, as we come to you right now, we come first of all to exalt you, for you are worthy to be praised. God, if you had never done anything for us, ever done anything for us you're worthy of praise because God just who you are 
Because you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the God of all glory. You're God Almighty who created the heavens and the earth. God, you, you, you saw, oversaw the, the creation of human beings. Every minute detail of creation. Lord God Almighty, what a marvelous, wonderful God you are. And you are worthy to be praised. It is you who have gone before us. Even for the moment we were born, by your prevenient grace, you went before us. And you saw us being knit together in our mother's wombs. We were fearfully and wonderfully made. Lord, there's not a person within the, the sound of this prayer today who is an accident. That every one of them are an own purpose. You have a plan and purpose for our life. The prophet has told us, I know the plans I have for you. They're for good and not for evil. They're not to harm you, but to prosper you. So, Lord God, I thank you for that. I thank you for that. I thank you that you're that God who's not only that creative God who spoke the world into being, but you're the God who speaks new life into us even today. Not only have you created, but you continue to create. Not only do you redeem, but you continue to redeem. What, not only have you healed in the past, but you continue to heal today. We praise you. We glorify your name. But God, we also come in humility. We humble ourselves before you. Because we know, Lord, there are times in our lives that we have done some things, we have said some things, we have thought some things that were not pleasing in your sight, they were not proper in your sight, they were in direct disobedience to your written word in the Bible, your infallible word, but God also, we knew this in our conscience that we, those things were not pleasing and proper and acceptable in your sight. Your spirit convinced us, even before reading it in your word, that there are some things were just wrong. They were not in your will. God, will you forgive us? Will you forgive us, Lord? Please forgive us. We claim your word today, your promise, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord God, we, we pray today that you would hear our prayers of thanksgiving because we know that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. And you have told us in your word in Thessalonians that in all things we should give thanks for. This is the will of God. This is what you want. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. We have so much to be thankful for. God, we thank you for the simple things in life that we take for granted. For food and shelter and clothing and friends and family and for the family of God. Oh, God, we take for granted gifts of music and song and singing. We take for granted those people that are closest to us, that should mean the most to us. We take for granted health and good health until we are in danger of losing it. We take for granted friends and family until we stand in risk of losing them. It's true, Lord. Sometimes we don't appreciate things that we have until we've lost it or are losing it. God, today, we want to thank you for all of our blessings. The air that we breathe and for those around us who share that air with us. Today, Lord, we come to lift up concerns. Lord, we have a, a prayer list here at the church and and we put that in print. But, Lord, we know there are other needs today that, that are coming to people's hearts and minds. Even as I, I pray this prayer right now, Lord. And so, Father God, I want to I do what your word says. I want to stand in silence before you so that your people, wherever they are, wherever they're listening, would spend just a moment lifting up silently those prayers that they have not lifted up. In 
in person, in voice. Father God, we thank you for hearing our request. I thank you for I thank you for hearing our request. Lord, we pray for those who are down and out, who are done in. We pray for those that are marginalized. Lord, we pray for children today, all around the world, those in our church. We pray for our youth and young adults in our church. God, this, this world that they're inheriting from us. Sometimes we've made mistakes in dealing with things we deal with here in life. But God, it's these generations that follow us will have to reap the, the benefits, both good and bad, the effects of our decisions. So we pray for our young adults and youth and children, Lord. Teach them well, Lord. Father God, as we pray, most of all, we thank you for your gift of salvation to an abundant life of peace and joy and contentment and, Lord, an uh, eternal life in you and with you in heaven. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who makes and, and only he can make that possible. We thank you for his example to us, but also his preaching and his gospel that he shared with us, not only shared in voice, but in person, in his life and his living and his lips. And we, Lord, we pray now that prayer that he taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not unto temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is a time in our worship service we would normally uh, receive the morning offering. We want to encourage you. We thank you, first of all, for your faithfulness in supporting Epworth Church financially. You've been so good, so faithful, and I thank you for that. We'd like to ask you to continue to do that. You may give online. You see information probably on your screen right now how you may um, give uh, your tithes and offerings online. And also, you're welcome to send your donations to P.O. Box 430, Phoenix City, Alabama, 36868. Uh, and now we're going to, uh, during this time, we would normally receive the morning offering. We'll hear an offertory, and then we'll hear some special music, other special music.
whenever I, uh, I, I I'm sure I've told this story before, uh, but whenever I, I do this song, it reminds me of, uh, I guess, back when I was in the seventh grade. Uh, a friend of mine, Tim Mills, and they went to Evangel Temple, but he invited me to invited me to come and go with uh, with their youth group to the Atlantic Civic Center to see Andre Crouch. And I said, well, I knew, you know, my tribute, I was familiar, but I, you know, that's about all I knew of Andre Crouch, so I went. And, you know, we were, we were up, at, grew up at Somerville right down the road, and we were, uh, we were listening to, tuning up to uh, the Oak Ridge Boys and, and Statler Brothers, and so that's kind of what I was used to. So I went, and, uh, and Andre Crouch, he did my tribute, but he also did uh, a soon and very soon, and, and uh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. And I was like, oh, these, these, are, not, these are not country and not from the hymnal, but you can do them in church. <laughs> but uh, he did this song as well, and this is probably one of my favorite. Uh, feel free to sing along at home. I know you'll be familiar with Through It All. I had many tears and sorrows And I've had questions for tomorrow And there have been times when I didn't know right from wrong But in every situation God gave blessed consolation Let my trials come to only make me strong Through it all Through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. I thank God for the mountains, and I thank Him for the valleys. And I thank Him for the storms He's brought me through. For if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that He could soften. I wouldn't know what faith in God could do. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Thank you so much, Kevin. That's a great word. I was sharing in an earlier service today how important it is to realize that there are a lot of ways that you spread the word of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And sometimes you preach the word of God. We like to believe that sermons are based on the on the pure, unadulterated, inerrant word of God. You like to believe also that um, that those songs are that the, the gospel has been shared in 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 songs like that, um, that are gospel messages. There are sermons in every one of those messages, uh, in every one of those songs. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, wow, I, I, I'll tell you, um, you could give Andre a run for his money. I want you to know that, brother. That was very good. I know he'd be proud of you. Well, we're going to spend some time in the Word this morning. We're going to continue to look at a series of messages entitled Happy Birthday to Us because we're celebrating uh, the fact that Pentecost, recognize the fact that Pentecost is the birthday of the church. And so that's when God breathed into the church the, the wind, the spirit, the, the breath of God and the Holy Spirit. 
and the and the church really came to life and hasn't looked back since then. So we're going to be looking at some selected passages of Scripture, and uh, we're going to begin with chapter 2 in the book of Acts in verses 1 through 4, and then I'll continue to guide you in some of the, uh, some of the verses that we'll be looking at. But first of all, I want to ask you to listen carefully. After all, this is the reading of God's holy. It is his inspired in his inerrant word. Again, in the book of Acts, second chapter, beginning with verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly the sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. There seemed to be what there, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that rested, separated, and it came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now I want to ask you to look further down the page at uh, verse number 21. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now continue down in the reading and look at verse 36. Beginning with verse 36, we read what Simon Peter is saying as he begin, continues to lift up Jesus Christ and, and witness about Jesus. As he preaches, he says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized if every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were about were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And then finally, I want you to look at verse 47. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Would you take a moment just to bow your heads and close your eyes? And if you would, would you pray for me as I pray with you? Gracious God, I pray that you would hide me in the shadow of your cross so that these, your people, would hear your voice above mine, and so they might discern the difference between the wisdom of God and the knowledge of a man. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you alone, Lord, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. Come, Holy Spirit, and just have your way in us and through us and in spite of us today. Father God, I pray that you would do a Pentecostal thing today. Wherever the Word of God is being preached, wherever the pure Word of God is being preached, Lord, I pray that, that we would see fruition, that your Word will come to fruition, that your Word that tells us that your Word will not return unto you void, but it would accomplish whatever it is you intend for it to accomplish. I pray, God, that we would see that today in our own hearing, in our own sight, Lord God. Well, I know, I know that as I preach, I'm not perfect. But I know that your word is, in, is perfect. That your word is infallible. That your word is inerrant. And God, I believe when your word and your spirit converge on human hearts, whether they hear my voice here in this sanctuary, where they hear my voice around the world, where they hear the word of God, if it's pure, I pray, Lord, I know that it will be of benefits. So, God, I pray for a Pentecostal experience wherever this word falls today. That souls will be saved and lives will be changed. And Lord, we ask all of this in the priceless and the perfect and the powerful name of Jesus Christ, believing as a little child. And again, we ask it in this priceless, perfect, powerful, precious name of Jesus, who is called the Christ. And let all God's people say, Amen. So in these last few weeks, we've been talking about the fact that there are Pentecost, there are Pentecostal, there is Pentecostal revival breaking out all over the world, and it's usually happening in places where you see the 
elements that were present on the first day of Pentecost being duplicated. In other words, wherever you see those things that were happening at Pentecost, and we've talked about several so far, wherever you see those, those elements that were present at Pentecost happening, you also see them happening in around the world. And as they are, revival is breaking out in Pentecostal proportions. Under the power of the Holy Spirit, we're seeing God's Word fulfilled, and Pentecost is happening, not only in churches, but in people's hearts and in their lives. It's a life-changing experience, this thing called Pentecost. It isn't just something that happened years ago, some 2,000 years ago, a harvest festival for the Jews, but rather it's something that's taking place in the here and now in people's hearts around the world, in places that I can't even see today. In places that we can't even spell. In people we never know. And so we began to look at those things. What are those elements that were present in the first day of Pentecost? And the one I want to focus on today is something that should be very simple for us. But my concern, my heart is that, my, is that somehow, some way, we put this on the back burner. We've been so effective, perhaps, in other things and so busy in doing other things in the church throughout the years that we've really forgotten why we're here. Now, listen to me, church. I'm convinced that one of the most important elements that were, was present on the first day of Pentecost was the fact that souls were being saved. Now, let me go back to that again. Because I'm concerned today that that is an element that is missing in so many of our churches today. Not only here, but around the world. The element, that the fact that souls were being saved. And you see that in the scripture today. In verse 21. They who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In verse 47. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. But we, I think in this day and time, we've come to the point that we don't even know that we need to be saved anymore. Folks don't even know they need to be saved anymore. They don't even know what they need to be saved from and to. I had somebody tell me some years back, some time ago, this thing about being saved, people getting saved, souls getting saved. That's a term we hear in other denominations. They name one by name. We don't use that terminology in the Methodist church. I'm thinking, do what? We don't use that termination. We don't talk about people being saved and about salvation in the Methodist church. If we're not, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. We should be ashamed. That's not another denominational thing. That's a Methodist emphasis. But you know what? more important than that, it's a biblical emphasis. It's a God emphasis. He tells us in the Word of God today the importance of people being saved this day and time. We don't even know that people need to get saved, let alone what they need to be saved from and to. Let me share some things with you about thoughts about that for just a moment. First of all, we need to understand we need to be saved from hell to heaven. There is such a place as hell. There is such a place as heaven. They're both in the Bible. Jesus talked about both people. Places. Jesus talked about hell. Jesus talked about heaven. In fact, he may have talked more about hell than he talked about heaven. They were real places for Jesus. Hell is a place for those that are lost, and heaven is a place for those who are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Those are real places, at least Jesus thought they were, because he talked about both places. But now, somehow, we've got a second opinion on God. Again, in his word, he uses the word twice people who are being saved it's in the old testament it's in the new testament but nowadays we we don't know i guess we think well we got to the point we don't know what happens when somebody dies maybe they're going to spend the rest of eternity just circling the atlanta airport for eternal life for eternity folks if something happens to the human soul when a person dies and folks, we need to be saved from hell to heaven. I'll tell you something else we need to be saved from. We need to be saved from each other. We need to be saved to an abundant life of peace and joy and contentment. We need to be saved from each other and from the craziness in the world today, from the isms in the world today. 
We need, I, I, look at, I look at the newspaper and I watch the news and I see all this thing about racism today. I think Jesus has got something to say about all of that, don't you? I think the Bible has something to say about that, don't you? But I think about some of these uh, ra- this isms and racism. I believe the Bible has got something to say about all of that. I believe God has something to say about it. I believe Jesus has something to say about all of that. I live for that day. I live for the day when when people begin to take seriously something that that I I think Martin Luther King said, Jr. said, and it's a marvelous statement in this, and I have a dream speech. He said he dreamed of that day when his children would grow up in America when, when people would not be judged by the color of their skin but rather by the content of their character. I think he's on to something there. I don't believe, uh, listen, let me tell you something, folks. I, I dream for that day when we finally come to the realization that there's only one race in the world today and that's the human race. And that God has a design and desire for salvation for the total human race. And that everybody, that somebody that Jesus Christ loved and that, that God loves and Jesus Christ died for. When are we going to get to the point, realize there's only one race, the human race. When are we going to get to the point, maybe we might take that suggestion. It must have been a suggestion instead of a commandment. Jesus said it was a great commandment. We must have thought it was a good suggestion when he said, you're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, even if that neighbor is a Samaritan. I'm like, I agree with that. what my brother said the other day. Folks, we don't have a skin problem in America today. We've got a sin problem in America today. If we deal with a sin problem, we'll deal with a lot of isms and problems like that in America today. We need to be saved from each other, from things like the isms, but also saved from each other, the debauchery and the the, uh, immorality, the sensuous lifestyles, the immorality that is so prevalent and present in in our world today. Please understand there was a time in the world when when God destroyed a city, Sodom and Gomorrah, because they were living like we are in America today. He's not fooling around about that sin thing. He was willing to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die a a death on the cross for our sins. That's how seriously he considers sin. In America today, in our world today, we need to be saved from each other. We need to be saved from hell to heaven we need to be saved from each other and we need to be saved from ourselves and the foolishness and the foolish decisions that we make when we walk outside the will and the way in the word of God we need to be saved from ourselves I cannot speak for you I cannot speak for your past I can't speak about the things you've done in your life or you're doing today but I can only speak about myself and I know where I've been and I know what I've done. And I can tell you that without exception, the times in my life when I have been the most discouraged and the times in my life when I've been in the most, the, the, largest, the biggest messes and the times I've hurt myself and other people more than any other time were the times that I was walking outside the will and the way and the word of God and I was not seeking that abundant life of peace and joy and contentment, but I was ra- rather I was instead walking in disobedience to God's printed an inspired word outside the presence of his Holy Spirit. Folks still need to be saved. People need to be saved. Need to be saved from hell to heaven. They need to be saved from from each other. We need to be saved from ourselves. Now, I got to tell you something, folks. The early Methodists understood that. They understood that. In fact, there were only two requirements to be a Methodist in 18th century England. You had two requirements. You had to have a desire to flee the wrath to come and to be saved from your sins. Those are the only requirements to be a Methodist in 18th century England. It all started there. To have a desire to flee the wrath to come and to be saved from your sins. 
Folks, I, I think sometimes I cannot speak for other churches. I cannot speak for other denominations. I cannot speak for our denomination. But it just troubles me. It concerns me. It bothers me that perhaps in our churches today we have forsaken our first love. We are like the John wrote about in the Revelation about the church of Ephesus who had lost their first love. We have nothing to do but save souls, but spend and be spent in it. And not, to go to not, not only those who want you, but those who want you the most. That's what our, the, the founders of the Methodist Church believed. That's what God believes. Look again at the Word of God in verse 21. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. In verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now let's talk about that for just a moment. And the Lord added to the church, the Lord added to the church daily those who are being what saved again we want to get a second opinion on God now that is God's plan for evangelism that is God's plan for church growth souls being saved but we can do it a different way we think we do all kind of creative things one thing we like to do, we, why we like to think we can grow a church indigenously. In other words, we think we can breed people fast enough that our church, incre church numbers will increase. Well, that's how that's working. How is that working for us in our denomination? How is that working for us? See, here's this. I think we have as many Methodists in the United States today as we've ever had. We probably have more Methodists in the United, um, in the United States today than we've ever had. I know, I know what the statistics say. I, I know what they're, they're saying. We're having a decline in, in total membership. And I, I, I get that. I understand that. But I'm convinced we've got more Methodists now than we've ever had in the United States. The problem is a lot of them are going to other denominations. They're sitting in the pews of other churches. We need to understand why that might be. We may need to examine the fact that maybe... They're hungering for something. Or they're finding something like salvation. We need to look at ourselves and examine ourselves. We think we can increase by indigenous just repopulating the churches. Or sometimes we think we can just increase by stealing other people's sheep. You know what I mean by that. We think we got the best show in town. We got the best preacher in town. If we got the best programs in town, we got the biggest buildings in town. If we got all those things, if, we, if we're the best show in town, then we can steal somebody else's sheep. But folks, that's not that's not growing a church. That's not building up the kingdom. All that is is adding to your membership roles. But that doesn't change a thing. We got folks on our membership roll that don't even know they're on the membership roll. We got there are folks that believe that because you're on a membership row of a church somewhere, you're saved. That doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean you're saved. That just means, it means your name is on a membership row. I ran into one fellow one time. He actually was a member of two churches. And I, I talked to him about it. I said, well, we need to take you off the church. He didn't want to do that. He, he wanted to be a member of both churches. Like somehow or another, that would make him twice saved. I don't understand that. Didn't make him saved at all. Now, the question was not, it's not important what church role your name is on. The only thing that matters ultimately is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's the only membership role that counts. Not in the church militant, but in the church triumphant. The early church understood that. The early Methodists understood that. Do you understand that? You see, all these churches are growing in Pentecostal proportion around the world. You'll find that most of those churches, without, almost without exception, most of those churches are growing by profession of faith. In other words, people having a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, they are fulfilling what Paul writes to the Ephesian church when he says we must be saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ and not by works lest any man should boast. And most of those churches that are truly growing, I'm not talking about adding to membership roles, I'm talking about those churches that are growing 
in leaps and bounds are churches where people are being saved, saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ and not by works lest any man should boast. Folks, it, can, it happened at Pentecost. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. It happened at Pentecost, and it could happen today. It can happen here. Because where the word of God is multiplied, the church multiplied. Because word, God's word is going to be fulfilled. It will not return to him void. And wherever the word of God is, is, is shared, the pure word of God is shared, that word is going to fall on some, some stony ground and such, but it's also going to fall on some fertile ground, and it's going to take root, and souls are going to be saved. Folks, we keep looking for ways to do evangelism, more creative ways of doing evangelism. We've got to understand sooner or later we've got to come to grips with the fact that, a, that evangelism is not a program of the local church. The evangelism is not a program of the church. But rather the church is a program of evangelism. That is the only reason we exist. Primarily the only reason we exist is to win saved souls, to win people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and make disciples of them so that they can go out and, 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 and be transformed and so that they can go out and win more people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ with a personal relationship to him, which indeed will transform their lives and they'll lead other people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and the church will grow exponentially. And that's how it happened. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. I want to ask you a question today, a couple of questions. Do you know somebody not saved that doesn't know Jesus Christ as the Lord of their life and the Savior of their soul? Do they matter to you? Does their eternal destiny mean, to you, mean anything to you? Maybe you ought to share Christ with them. What do you think? Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about the Jesus that loved you, that, they gave, that died on the cross for, for, for your sins. That, that was buried, but in a, was put in a tomb, but rose on the third day to ascend into heaven. Tell them about that Jesus that saves. Because the Bible said, whoever believes on the Lord and Jesus Christ will be saved. It's just that simple. Let me ask you another question today. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Do you know him as the Lord of your life and the Savior of your soul? Again, I'm not asking you today. Is your name on a membership record anywhere? Is your name on a membership road? I'm not asking you if you're a member of a church anywhere. That's not what I'm asking you today. I'm asking you, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Do you know Jesus Christ as the Savior of your soul? Do you know him as the Lord of your life? It's a simple question. It's either yes or no. You know. If you're saying maybe, the answer is no. If you're saying I may, the answer is no. It's either yes or no. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Do you know him as the Lord of your life? If you died in this very instant, where would you spend eternity, in heaven or in hell? It's just that simple. It's either yes or no, heaven or hell. I'm going to ask you again, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord? And if you don't know him as your Savior and Lord, I want to ask you another question, and that is, what are you waiting for? There's not a better time than today. There's not a better moment than today. It won't get a better opportunity in this very instant. Right now, I can tell you something. I can tell you that our hymn of invitation is number, uh, in the hymn book, is number 398. The title of it is Jesus Calls Us. I can tell you that, as far as I know, that Kevin over here is going to, in, in just a moment, he's going to get up here and he's going to lead us in a hymn of invitation. I can tell you that Christina Loskatova is going to get on the piano and she's going to play. That's what we think. That's what's on our order of worship. And I can also tell you that that may not happen. In the next 10 seconds, Jesus may come back. I can tell you that some of you think you're going to lunch today at your favorite restaurant. Because some of the restaurants are opening up. And some of you think you're going to have a good meal. That may not happen. In the next three seconds, Jesus may come back. And the only thing that's going to matter in those next few moments is not what we're going to sing for the next song, Kevin, or what we're going to play, Christina. Brother Mark, it won't make any difference how well the sound said. This sounds great in here, but it won't matter anymore. It won't matter. The only thing that's going to matter is did you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you saved to eternal life and, and that abundant life of peace and joy and contentment? And second of all, who did you bring with you to heaven? Did you lead somebody else to save your knowledge of Jesus Christ? Those are the only things that's going to matter. 
And I want to pray with you about that for right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that the prayer of our hearts today, I pray that the prayer of every person that's listening to this message today, every single one, I pray that the prayer of our hearts would be a simple childlike prayer of faith, that we can know that we know that we know that we know that we know that Jesus Christ is our personal Savior, that we are saved from our sins, and we will inherit heaven and not hell. Father God, I pray that the simple childlike prayer of faith of every person that is listening to my voice today would be, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are God's Son. And I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you were put in a tomb, but that you rose from the grave so that I might have eternal life. And I believe, Lord, one day you'll, you'll come to judge the quick and the dead, the living and the dead. Lord Jesus, I believe you're God's son, that you died on the cross for my sin, that you rose again. And Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I'm a sinner because your word tells me that. But your word almost also promises me that if I confess my sins, you are faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Your word tells me that if I believe on you, I can be saved. And so, Lord, so Lord in simple childlike pray, prayer, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart to be my Savior, my personal Savior. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, that I might have new life, to convince me of how to live for you from this day forward. Lord Jesus, I pray that in this moment you would save my soul for eternity and that you would also give me an abundant life of peace and joy and contentment. And Lord Jesus, because I have prayed this prayer and are based on your word, which is infallible and will never fail us, I thank you for saving me. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for giving me a testimony about the moment in time when I trusted Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life and the Savior of my soul. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you give me the boldness to share with other people that I have decided this day to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. And from this day forward, I will live for him. Lord, I pray that I would share that testimony with others so that they too can know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And Lord, I ask all of this believing in simple childlike faith in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, as we come to the close of our service, we're just going to ask Brother Kevin to come. He's going to lead us. We think and Jesus calls us. And as, as, as you listen again to this message in song, listen again. There is a sermon in this song. It's just as important as anything I've said, anything I've said in my sermon. Not as important as the pure, unadulterated word of God, but it's, it's just as important as any sermon I've preached with my mouth today because this sermon, this song has a sermon. I want you to let it speak to you, and I want you to sing it like you really mean it. If you've never sung it like you mean it before, I pray that you sing it like you mean it today. Come on, Brother Kevin, lead us in, if you would, in the closing of our service, and perhaps if you would, in a benediction, would you do that? Would you join me in our closing hymn, Jesus Calls Us. Thank you.
And Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we're able to come together in Christian fellowship and in Christian, Christian lives, Lord. We thank you for the message that's been laid on our hearts. We ask that you give us the strength and the courage that we apply that message to our lives as we go into the world today. As we leave here today, we ask that you go with us. Lead, guide, and direct us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.